So welcome everybody. I am Alex Gartenfeld. I am the artistic director at ICA Miami. And I am very pleased to welcome you to what I believe is our 10th annual Soho House Talk. Um, we love this moment during the week to take a pause and speak with one of the extraordinary artists in our program. And uh, this morning we have a particularly extraordinary artist, Sasha Gordon, to my right. I'm going to start everybody with a round of applause for Sasha, please, <laughs> and a welcome. Now I'm going to talk about Sasha in a minute, but there are a number of partners who make this talk and this program and all the work that we do so wonderful. And first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, um, Private Client Select, formerly known as AIG, Private Client Group. Um, it's a fabulous organization. Um, we actually travel with uh, members of the team, and it's an incredibly fun risk management tool I personally can recommend, and we're so glad to have you with us. Um, this is our third year of partnership, and they are supporters of Sasha's exhibition in ICA Miami. Um, Private Client Select provides risk management solutions and insurance, and insurance services to ensure private art collections remain safe for generations to come. I also want to um, uh, thank a very special group named Asteri, which has also come on to support this event. Asteri um, has provided additional support for the Asteri, um, it's the Asteri Collective. Um, it's an invitation-only community uh, for women in leadership positions across industries and family. Um, female empowerment, as well as risk management, are both important parts of what Sasha Gordon and her practice are representing, so thanks to both and thanks for being with us. Now, um, ICA Miami, I hope you've all visited. We had an amazing opening on Tuesday evening and we're so excited to welcome our 4,000 closest friends to celebrate Sasha. Um, we are a contemporary art museum with a robust collecting program. Um, we were, among other things, the first and very, very, very fortunate institutional collection to acquire a work of Sasha's alongside the hammer from an absolutely fabulous um, exhibition that she had in Matthew Brown Gallery in Los Angeles, I believe in 2021, although it feels like years and years ago. Um, our collection begins in 1957, but the work that we do is about establishing the history and lineage of the most exciting work being made today, and Sasha and her exhibition, Surig itself, which is in our Yarkin family project space and our Lipton family gallery, um, is certainly exemplary of that type of leadership. Um, you've probably seen some of Sasha's imagery online because it's quite viral and it communicates beautifully across digital platforms. But I also encourage you to see it in person because and it, one of the, we'll talk about both of those themes today, um, but the absolute skill and the absolute ingenuity of technique that Sasha expresses through her paintings is a sight to behold. Um, she has shared with us in Surrogate Self, which is her debut solo institutional exhibition, um, some nine paintings. They're large scale and they're all self-portraits. And with that and with today, they express an incredible spirit of generosity, humor, candor, self-possession, all these great things that Sasha represents. So you've heard about it enough from me already. I want to let Sasha introduce herself a little bit, if you don't mind. We'll start the conversation there. Um, I hate remarking this, but I sort of have to, which is you are such an incredibly precocious talent. And I think a lot of people in the audience who are meeting you for the first time and are so impressed by what you've done, I think it would just be wonderful if you could tell us a little bit about um, your journey to this exhibition and, in particular, what inspired you to become an artist. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess, well, I started actually wanting to do like um, fashion design at a very young age. I think I was very interested in like details and, and like materiality. Um, so I would constantly draw like little croquis, fashion croquis and, but I, th I think I was more interested in the figure. Um, so I've always been like really fascinated by portraiture and figurative paintings. Um, and then I 
I, I guess I, in college, I got more interested in, like, identity and um, narrative of the paintings, and recently I'm kind of going back more towards portraiture and, like, these more isolated scenes, mm -hmm. um, and kind of, I've always been interested in, like, flesh, but I think I'm trying to, like, expand from that with these, like, these objects and um, these different transformations of the figure. Um, Amari, I'm going to have you just click through. We have some images from the show. Well, we can talk about them in depth later. I don't want to necessarily look at them, but I want to have for reference. So when you arrived at, at RISD, um, what type of work were you making, and how did your work change um, over that time? I know that, as you mentioned, fashion and an incredible attention to detail has always been a big part of your work. But I understand you were probably also making portraits at that time, too. And so how would you describe that work looking back on it today? Um, I guess, like, in high school, I was taking these, like, little after-school classes at FIT because I thought I wanted to do fashion, but I, I felt like it was kind of a vapid industry. It's just not for me. Um, so then I, I think I was just, like, sketchbooking a lot and just looking at a lot of, like, images on Tumblr because I was, like, very online. Um, and... Yeah, I just started to draw just like random like celebrities or like models, and then from there I went to do these like hyper realistic like um, portraits that were pretty at the time I thought were large scale, like maybe like four feet, um, and I think that was super helpful because that's kind of where I started to like learn more about the skill of painting and the craft. Um, and then once I got to college, I was still doing that, and I think a lot of my professors were kind of um, pushing me more to think more conceptually about art, and I think I was lacking like a personal narrative um, and connection to my work. Um, and then from there, I, yeah, I just started to reflect a lot more about my life. I think there are a lot of things I just ignored for a while, and when my teachers told me this, I kind of pushed myself to just um, kind of like reanalyze my like upbringing and uh, my environment that I grew up in. And from there, I kind of got more into like painting um, uh, more personal experiences. The I want to linger on a few things that you just said. The first was, and we've talked about it just sort of in our conversations, is that a lot of your friends are artists, and you met a lot of them who have fabulous careers, who are at our opening, Oscar Yehu, Amanda Ba, Dominique Fung. You met them through sharing your work online at a very early age, and then those relationships and those careers and those just practices have blossomed. How did that kind of figure into some of your creative development and, and, you know, and meeting people and the kind of conversations you were having? Um, it was really amazing. I, I found um, Amanda and Oscar, who are both amazing painters, I think maybe like end of high school or early college online. And I I still wasn't thinking so much about like representation and the importance of it in art. I was just, I think subconsciously, I felt very comforted by seeing their work and how we had kind of similar um, lives as artists, uh, as young artists. And um, I think it's great to just like have conversations with them and um, there's some things that we like don't need to like actually talk about because it's just kind of like a mutual understanding. And do you ever talk about technique and how you make work or how that's developed? I mean, I will say in my conversations, even with other artists throughout this week, who all of whom come up to me and are so excited about your presentation, what you do, there is an a level of technological astonishment at what you're able to create. Um, I guess, first of all, how did you, without revealing any trade secrets, how did you acquire those skills, and how much of that is, your converse, is part of your conversation with other artists? Uh, a lot of the time, it's about that, for sure. Um, I think, I mean, I'm constantly curious about how my friends make their work, because, you know, just sometimes I'll go to their studios, it just appears on the canvas the next day. Um, I, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Your trade secrets. My trade secrets. Oh, um, yeah, I just painted a lot. Like, I think in high school I would, like, come home from school and I wouldn't do my homework. 
um, and I would paint for like five hours, just five hours straight. Um, so I was very, I'm very obsessive with things that I like. So I was very fixated on painting for a while, and then um, yeah, I just really honed in on that. And then um, it really does take time to get better. Like I thought, like oh, my paintings can't get better. It's like so hyper realistic and then I like look back at it and it's like kind of shit so <laughs> it's <laughs> sorry <laughs> um so it's like it is interesting like how the more you work it's like it actually does progress and cool. evolve and I think like now I'm more um I pay more attention to like the surface and um how things are made instead of just like making them look a certain way I just like I care about the the mark making and everything now I'm gonna move on from your childhood, but I have one like kind of last question, which is I was talking, we were at dinner with Jeffrey Deitch the other night, who is also a wonderful supporter of your work. And he remarked to me, which I thought was really interesting, that your father, Greg, is an eye doctor, and that the eyes are so important in your work. There are entire worlds in them. Now, um, are we making that the connection, or is that something that's, is there, a, was there a fascination there? I mean, of course, eyes have a broad ranging significance, um, but there is this incredible attunement to biology and the surface of eyes. Um, is that from childhood, or is that just something that you delight in rendering? Delight in rendering. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a bit of both. I, I mean, I remember like seeing like all these, eye doctor ophthalmologist magazines around the house um so I constantly would be reminded that we have eyes mm -hmm. um <laughs> and then um yeah I also was just like very insecure about my eyes so I think like I would just try to like draw like blue eyes and stuff like that all over my sketchbooks and everything and then like I just found like comfort in drawing them mm -hmm. and I also think just like a lot of my friends who are also artists just grew up just like drawing eyes like on their homework and stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. And this is the, the, this exhibition, which comprises about, I'd say, uh, let's say four fifths of what you've made this year. So you've dedicated an entire year to self portraiture, um, which is a little bit of a, a shift. And I'd say that there's um, one painting, which is in the exhibition, which is slightly earlier, Maybe we can even click to it. It's the Venus painting. I call it a mermaid painting, but it's really more of a Venus. Oh, not this one, although she could be a mermaid too. <laughs> not this one, not that one, not this one, not that one. There we go. So this painting from 2022, like Froth, is this the first of the self-portraits? I mean, actually, that, I know that's actually not the, tr not the truth, but yeah. this sort of painting inaugurated a theme of becoming and was there a specific inspiration or commission that led you down that line of thinking um i think yeah this was the first of this like new like anthropomorphic or transformation um disguising theme um i guess there was a part of me that wanted to like um expand from painting like fleshy figures, but I was experiencing something at the time um, where I felt super vulnerable, and I remember um, just feeling very inspired by this painting, like the Botticelli painting at that moment, and I was thinking a lot about how um, certain people would make me feel and how I felt um, in these dynamics, um, specifically like very racially, the dynamics. Um, and my role is like an Asian queer woman in these like romantic um, situations. Um, and how I was like told to like be okay in these situations when they were very um, convoluted. Um, and I just wanted to create this scene where it, it's almost serene, but she's, it's like it's very isolated and kind of precarious, like this rock. Um, it's kind of floating, but also drowning, and um, it's like fiery sunset. Um, and she's very like 
exposed, which I, I think this is the first painting I've kind of been very, um, a lot more op literally open. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was um, definitely like the, the, the launching point for the rest of the show or for this theme. And one of the things that you referenced a bit, and uh, I want to see if it's accurate in this question is, and I think one of the things that we all love about your work is that it is channeling in such a complex and interesting way from art historical tropes and art historical art histories, but is also immensely personal um, and in a way that feels really generous and really engaging and affirming for people as well. And but maybe we could take the first part of that description and talk a little bit about portraiture and art history even, and why, at what point that became um, kind of crucial for the way that you were working. Um, I, one of my professors, uh, Jennifer Packer, she was really encouraging to look at like Caravaggio and um, Titian and uh, Bocelli, I think I, Sometimes I'll get stuck on just contemporary art, which I think is amazing, but I think it's because I'm like drawn to the colors and this new wave of like technique. But I think for like the way that um, composition and the way that the figures can the figures can interact is just like those like romantic or Renaissance paintings. It's like unlike anything else. Um, so I definitely try to like go to museums to like figure out compositions and. Um, get inspired from those. And there is an art historical line of thinking that is about um, intervening in histories that were potentially male dominated in terms of who was rendering and those were inevitably oftentimes female subjects who had less input into them and certainly they were white subjects and I'm sure that that's part of your inquiry as well but how central was that and how central those observations when you when you go to a museum and when you start start making this body of work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for me to, like, reimagine a lot of these scenes. I think, like, I love to see these paintings, but I also am never fully satisfied sometimes, and I, I would like to make things that I want to see. I want to continue the sort of think about art history by looking at, it's an image of, say, eight figures with a knight in shining armor at the center of it. Not this one, not this one. Not that one. One more, there you go. So um, there's an art historical reference for this work, which is, um, I think, also unique uh, in the practice in that it's, it's, it's quite, there is one citation. Um, it's a painting by George Roche Gross. <laughs> and it's a fabulous painting. We actually should have prepared it and had it up here. I encourage you to Google George Roche Gross Night because it's a wonderful painting, actually very different from this. Um, this is such a fascinating picture and there are so many different aspects of yourself or oneself in them. What was so interesting about this art historical figure and painting that drew you to it and inspired your interpretation? Um, I just, it was a very, it's a very captivating painting. It's, um, I, I just think it's so beautiful when there's like some type of reflection like in a painting, like a Van Eyck painting with the, the mirror in the back. Um, and in the, in the, um, the original painting, um, it's this, this this male knight figure with these naked kind of like nymphs running around with like these flowers on their head. Um, I think they're trying to like seduce him, it seems. Um, so I kind of wanted to take on this like male role. Um, and I guess this has to do a lot with like projection and me seeing myself and other people and um, kind of pulling back and being stoic in a way because it's, you know, uh, disorienting in a way. Now this is such a, this is such a complex picture in that there's so many figures. And so I do want to pull out and just ask sort of like a technical question, which is uh, how much preparatory study is there for this? And I've never really seen photography in, 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 your studio, I, I think I'm correct, mm -hmm. um, there is some drawing, but for 
uh, an image as complex as this, how much kind of compositional preparation do you have to do um, to create this? Or is it pure invention on the canvas? Um, so parts of it are, I would say, um, for the figures, I want them to be very sculptural. So I do take photos, a lot of self-timer, or my friend Amanda also paints herself nude a lot of the time, so we'll both take turns, <laughs> um, which is very helpful. Um, but then, you know, it's like, this armor doesn't exist, so it's like I, I have to do a lot of, um, like, just find a lot of images for references um, and for lighting. And it was hard because the lighting and this was kind of, like, backlit. So I, I had to do a few little mock-ups, but I, I really don't do that many, like, preliminary stuff. I kind of... Um, do like a, a like a quick crude sketch in my sketchbook, mm -hmm. maybe for like ten minutes, and then I just like figure out where I need to place things. Um, Cause I I hate doing the same thing twice. I like to I like to like I, it's very intuitive. I like to like yes. go as I go. But it's fascinating in this particular image the way that you've been able to capture the reflection. And you mentioned Van Eyck. Are you sitting there with a mirror too, or is that through your phone, or what is giving you this tools, or are you just, just trusting that we just assume your the reflections yeah. are what they are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of, I mean, there's a lot of layers. Like I, I think, anytime I get to the part where it's a, it's not skin, it's some other material, I probably have to try like more than twenty times, like a different technique. Sometimes it works out the first time, but. Um, it was a bit of a challenge at first because I genuinely was like, I don't know how to make the skin metal. This doesn't exist, but um, yeah. Are you, um, say, thrift, are you like on eBay being like, I need a, a suit of armor or is it all coming from web imagery? Um, yeah, a lot of like Pinterest. Sometimes I'll go on Etsy. <laughs> um, Amazon sometimes uh -huh. has some weird things, yeah. Amari, if we could go to the seashell painting, there's a lot to unpack there as well. One more. There's a, l a lot to say about this image, I think. It's, yeah, I think, just such an extraordinary masterpiece, dare I say. It's a really, really wonderful and engaging painting. Um, I want to start with, well, I'll start with the left side, which is, is it a mother of pearl figure, and is it a self-portrait as well, or is it um, is this a sort of an intervention of another character into the painting? I mean, I think all the figures are like doppelgangers of me. I definitely connect with certain figures more than others. Um, I kind of just think of them in this like Sasha world, so that's why I paint them all kind of in my likeness. Um, but the the mother of pearl abalone figure is this kind of like menacing, um, ghostly being. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of I want the viewer to not be sure if they can trust her or not. Um, and I wanted her to be this kind of like fragile, but hard material. And the figure in the foreground's kind of. Um, I, I guess it's about um, how I sometimes think I'm perceived as this very like soft, gentle being, and um, people have to like <clears throat> walk around around me very delicately. But um, I really value this like directness and honesty, and um, this figure is kind of hiding behind this shell. Um, yeah. Now she's um, doing something which I love about your work and about human relations in general is she's making deep eye contact. <laughs> um, in this particular instance, she seems to be, she's perhaps having an epiphany or she's, her eyes are purple. Perhaps um, we've discussed maybe she's being informed of something untrue and it's turning or, or uh, revelatory and it's changing the color of her eyes. 
But I'd love to, within the context of this painting and just generally, talk about the kind of address that your paintings make and how much you think about that beforehand because I will say for, um, especially for employees at the museum um, who tend to be young artists oftentimes, they establish such an incredible deep connection to this work and I think it has a lot to do with technique and I think it has a lot to do with the themes that you deal with but I also think it has to do with um, these doppelgangers of you are making such wonderful, respectful, generous address of people in front of them. And how much do you think about that and how much is that sort of playing out in this painting? I, I mean, I definitely think a lot about eye contact. I think some have more direct eye contact than others, obviously. And um, I think it's like, I, I, I want certain people to see the paintings and kind of have this um, connection to the work that, this like relatability. <coughs> um, and I also want some people to feel uncomfortable with it. I think there's people that might not understand it, and I think that's a good thing to happen, mm -hmm. that they feel the discomfort. And talk to me also a little bit about um, this side of the painting, which I just love. And uh, it's a beach scene, and I think probably it's one of these places where you ev self-evidently had a lot of fun rendering these mm -hmm. things. What fascinates me is how both hyper real they are, but also absolutely flat. Yeah. Um, and there's these different planes happening. And that superimposition is just so technically, just impressive. But tell me a little bit about just this foreshortened space and um, how you thought about that. And if also, I'll just lead a little in this direction. If the phone, for instance, had something to do with the way mm. that that image played out. Um, I think it's like, I, I feel my paintings are very dreamlike um, and I never want them I want them to have like realistic elements but I never want them to look like a photo or something that could actually exist I mean I, I do want it to exist but um, I still want it to be this like disorienting like wonky perspective um, so I like to make the proportions off and like like in the night painting I think the the figures in the back are sometimes bigger than the people in the foreground um, and I think it kind of makes that uneasy, unsettling feeling that dreams can have when you like feel like you're falling or jumping and it just feels like the floor is like right there. And yeah, I think it's just to, I think it enhances the unsettledness. Well, I will say that in, in all the shows that I've curated in my career, I've never thought about just the power of imagination and inspiration so much as thinking about your work and sharing your work with people. Um, to that point on dreams, in generating this imagery, are you keeping a dream journal? Are you um, listing sort of things? Like how are you um, distilling these, this from this vast well of images that come into the portraits? Um. Sometimes it's really random. Um, I find out like later on, like I'm maybe like subconsciously connected to something, and it it makes sense as the painting goes on. But sometimes I'll just I think the volcano one I just was like me as volcano <laughs> <laughs> sounds kind of awesome. Um, so it, it really depends. But I I usually just like jot things down um, if I'm like inspired in the moment or like right before a show. I just like brainstorm. And I. That's a great segue because I would love to actually show the volcano painting on screen. And we you've spoken a bit in this conversation about um, what you feel comfortable sharing through the paintings or what how you use the paintings to work out personal situations in your life, which is an amazing way of uh, approaching an artistic practice too. Now, this painting is rather potently about anger and the, or frustration and the performance of, of anger and frustration and how those things are, are seen generally. Um, is there one instance that led to this volcanic explosion that you wanted to share with the world or, uh, or one motivation or was it a more kind of general observation? I think it was more general. I, 
I mean, I'm definitely, like, I can be a really angry person. I'm very obsessive, so, like, if something bothers me, I'm, like, pissed. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I think there's just a lot of times where I have so many emotions and I can feel super, like, invalidated by um, the way other people react to it. Um, and I thought of, like, making this, this, like, natural form and you know volcanoes erupt it's like no one's gonna question it so it, it felt like very um comforting to paint for sure um it's such to me such an important painting where you're seeing yourself in the painting and also clearly thinking about how you're perceived i'm going to change directions very sort of severely before i open up for questions and uh studio practice is clearly such a big part of what you do. You couldn't share this with the world if you didn't have an incredible dedication to your studio. And um, I know that for this show, very proudly, there were no all-nighters. But could you tell me a little bit about, and with us, a little bit about life in the studio and what is going on as you're making these paintings and as you're finishing the marbleized surface of a volcano or a mother of pearl? Yeah, I mean, I uh, start my day at like, 12 sometimes <laughs> recently it's been better um <clears throat> i used to be like a night owl at call in college so i've been adapting to 9 to 12 to 8 9 to 5 almost um and i usually get in i think it's really scary to enter your studio um the first time in the day it's just like really daunting especially if there's like nothing on the canvases um so I try to like set goals for myself and usually I like take notes the night before to like figure out what I need to do the next day um and I will procrastinate a lot but then at some point I will just like have the urge to paint let it happen and yeah I, I try not to distract myself too much but I do get very distracted. I, I, I love to see like friends and have studio visits and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it requires a lot of time. So I do have to be pretty disciplined. So my last question before I turn over is one I'd actually love the answer to, although I don't want to be do too direct or too prescriptive in how we interpret anyone painting. But I'm so personally fascinated by the planetary systems that are in so many of the eyes. Um, could you tell us about the kind of worlds within worlds that are in the, the, the eyes and at the center of so many of these paintings? Um, I just, I don't know, I just, I love like movement. I, I think like sometimes I see a fabric that's like standing still, but I see the patterns move and, um, or like when you close your eyes and you see those like dots moving around, I kind of want to replicate that feeling. So it's like the you're l thinking about um, really the motion of a solar system more than astrology or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, last 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 question from me is: uh, This was an extraordinary body of work, and I know a tremendous amount of work. And what I love that you're having a moment in Miami to celebrate, but also relax. But what is sort of the next thing on your to-do list and what are you kind of looking forward to in and out of the studio? Um, I definitely want to draw a lot more. I think I, I I think a lot of painting just starts with drawing. I think even painting is drawing and vice versa. So I, I feel like I, I definitely want to draw a lot more and maybe try like some other mediums. Um, maybe like take some time to, to not show certain things and keep some to myself. And I always want the work to evolve. Like I really don't want things to stay the same. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just experiment a bit more and have some things hidden. It's a very wise approach. Um, please everybody, a uh, round of applause for Sasha Gordon. We'll have time for a few questions. Do I have any help emceeing or an extra microphone or maybe we do? Yes, Chris, thank you. We had a question over here and he's gonna, Chris is gonna help you with the microphone. Okay, thanks. Uh, for 
those of us who are new to you, and I'm so glad to know about you, I was wondering if we could quickly go through some of the other pictures and have you describe what's going on and some of your thoughts about that would be really interesting. It, do you want to choose one or two? Um, yeah, I mean, which... Is there one in particular? The sweater's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this one's intense. It's... um. I thought she was giving herself a hug, but my therapist said it looks like a straight jacket. Um, so, yeah, it was during a very, like, vulnerable time. I think it was, like, a lot of shit was hitting the fan. Um, and I just kind of wanted to make a painting that felt very, like, cozy to me. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, like, obviously very, like, wounded and has, like, all these, like, punctures and um, gaps all over her body and... Um, yeah, I just wanted, but I wanted her to have this weird sense of, like, strength in her eyes, I guess. Like, she, it, it's hard to read her emotions, and I feel like before, like, in my past work, I used to, like, be a bit more direct with how they're feeling, but I kind of want it to be more ambiguous. Um, maybe, like, a sense of, like, knowing, um what's happening in the future, but also kind of unsure. You want to do one more? You think that's good? Uh, I'll talk about them. The I'm wearing the glasses. <laughs> um, yeah, this is me as a marshmallow. I This one was for, <laughs> it started off for fun. I, I, I think I, I really do like adding humor to my work. I think sometimes the subject matter can be really dark and, I I think I'm a pretty silly person. So I just had this idea and I've also never really incorporated like food in my work and that definitely has a lot to do with like body image and um that topic. So and and I think this whole show had a lot to do with like hard versus soft, like the the surface of the figures. Um so I wanted to make her this like kind of passive uh, figure. It was very like pliable and um, easy to manipulate, but she's kind of letting these torches um, roast her. I was curious about the skewers in the as the um, hair ties. So uh, she's kind of it's uh, like a s'more, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But it's rendered as, <laughs> is it, it's rendered in a different, totally different language as the rest of the painting too. Yeah, I. I just wanted her to be like this like sexy librarian. Like I I was just having fun with this one. So I yeah, I put these like um like twigs in her hair to make her look like she's about to be a, a s'more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have uh three questions. Maybe those will be the three we do. We have one over here in the center. Yeah. Hi, Sasha. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to know how your mixed cultural background has influenced your work. I know your mother's Korean. Um, I grew up as a Vietnamese, Chinese, American, and um, growing up, there's just been a lot of conflict between my parents and I, and so I would love to know how that's impacted your work and if you've had similar experiences um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the way I um, thought of myself and the way that I thought people perceived me growing up was a very confusing time. I think I had a lot of, um, I was I was suffering a lot of denial and also just really uncomfortable. And I think um, when I paint now, I really try to emulate that in the work, but also a sense of comfort, because I definitely feel, like, way more um, sure of, like, who I am as a person now. I think growing up, um, it was always kind of, like, all over the place, and, yeah. We had a, two other questions. Billy, did you still have a question? No? We had one over here? Oh, sorry. 
Uh, Sasha, I wanted to thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, your show is fabulous. And my question is, what artists do you, uh, or the past or, the few or present, what artists inspire you, who you reference? most of the time, and also what truly inspire you to create work, besides you, your sparkling personality, what it is, what moves you in this world? That's a hard question. I, I feel like I always say Lisa Yaskovich every single time. Um, recently it's been Tetsuya Ishida, who this, was this Japanese painter who had a show at Gagosian and he also does a lot of like anthropomorphism and transformation in his work, and he also paints a lot about his like anxieties. And I've I felt a lot of, um, I I just felt very like I I felt very comforted by his work and felt very connected to it. Um, and then I guess like, I'm inspired by like living my life. I guess I don't know. I <laughs> like I. I, I feel like I get stuck in studio if I'm not like going out and seeing people and and seeing friends and experiencing. Um, but yeah, I guess I I go to like shows a lot. I, I try to see as many shows as I can. It's hard sometimes when I have a deadline, but I'm trying to. Now I have a lot of free time, so. Okay. Oh wait, Chris has got a. Uh, in the painting, uh, tell me, the first thing we see is the shell, and of course you, and sitting here right across, first I was thought that, that it was the shell that was telling you probably something, but then I saw that there was fingers in the back, and can you talk about who, that someone whispering in your ear uh, beside the shell? So is there anything that you want to share more about the person beside the shell that's so obvious? Um, yeah, I wanted it to be um, kind of a painting that you take in really slowly. Um, the figure, the foreground figure and the shell is very like fluorescent and bright. Um, and right, like, I mean, this is a very um, confusing uh, pattern. Like it's, it's very ambiguous. Um, so I wanted it to be that you read her first and then kind of go around the shell and then find out that it's this creepy, ghostly um, figure that's lying, <laughs> lying to her. Thank you for this uh, fascinating insight into your your world. But seeing that you're RISD New York and we're on the East Coast, I mean Miami, I'm obsessed with the sunrise in the morning over the sea. So your piece that uh, was on the Venus, for me, without after hearing your interpretation, it changed my vision of it. Because for me, I saw this, the beach, the sea, the sunrise. So for me, I saw it as waking up, as a rising, as a very positive morning with possibilities, rather than the sunset and as you, as you described it. So that was just the statement I wanted to make. I think that's a really amazing thing about um, Sasha's work, is that she meets you connects with you, you know, through her eyes and leaves it open for you to interpret. I mean, I think that's also the power of art is to, you know, ask questions as much as provide answers, whether it's sunrise or sunset. Yeah, I actually never thought about that, so that's very, very interesting. I mean, I kind of, I'm, I'm down for it to be both. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I, I, um... I like when things are unsure. I don't. I don't want anything to be like a permanent. Like the things I'm saying right now might not apply to these paintings like next year. Tomorrow, you know, yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll have time for one last question. Um, we've oh, I think someone over there. Oh, 
Ah, two last questions, sorry. Um, I'm a painting major. I go to Savannah, Scott Ar Savannah Art School. Mm -hmm. And like how you describe your artist is how I see you. I love seeing your work. I'm always inspired by everything you do. I also really like hyper-realism in work in self-portraits. So I wanted to ask you, I know how much time painting details gets, and I know how interesting and how amazing it is. But I wanted to ask you, um, what do you like to listen to? Like, what YouTube videos do you watch? What music? <laughs> like, do you listen to podcasts? It's bad. My Spotify <laughs> wrapped is really bad this year. Um, a lot of music. I I don't know. I used to listen a lot to, like, the strokes and stuff. Like, really? I was very... <laughs> I love yeah, I was, <laughs> Okay, cool. I was very an indie rock Tumblr girl, and then um, now it's like really gay. <laughs> Just listen to a lot of like pop girls and okay. Kylie Minogue. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of that. I just like uplifting stuff. There, yeah, and then some podcasts here and there I like I, I'm bad at um, sticking with them but I think music sometimes helps the most but sometimes I can't listen to music like I go through phases of um, maybe like a few like a month or two of just not listening to music when I work because um, it's like I, I think too much sometimes yeah and our one last question over here if we've got the microphone oh, thank, thank you Chris you. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, also a painter, so I wanted to ask about the scale of your work. When in the show, there's the sweater piece that's smaller, but then it's so with the level of detail you're painting, and it seems so time-consuming and impressive to go such large scale. So, how do you think about going larger and what that allows for composition and complexity and nuance? And have you liked the scale shift? Um, I guess some some of the paintings I want to be more immersive. And others, I want to feel more quiet and um, intimate. Um, so it really depends on like what the the feeling I'm trying to portray of the painting is. Um, I think, well, obviously, it's like a lot easier to paint like a narrative painting on like a bigger um, scale because it's like you can have the figures be like life size, and I really enjoy seeing that. Like, I think. We all like to see like the figure be like double the size of how it really is. Um, I think it just depends. Like sometimes I want to be more playful, so I want to like move around the the canvas and um, have more freedom with the movement. Well, I think I speak for everyone in saying thank you so much for your generosity and sharing, and we're so inspired by your inspiration of living your life, and we're excited to have you continue to do that and share these moments with us. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, Surrogate Self um, is on view through at least April, maybe May. I'm sorry, I'm bad with dates. Um, as you can tell from this conversation, it needs to be seen to be believed, so I hope you have a, a chance to see it. I also want to say I'm heartened to see that there's so many painters in the audience. I think that speaks to just the power of, of what Sasha does. Thanks all for being with us. Thank you, Private Select. Thank you, Asteri. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank Sasha Gordon.